Greetings. This is going to be part four of the Jesuit Jewish Connection. This part, I'm going to tie up everything. Now, I want you to take a look at some of the links that I have below in the description box. The Jews absolutely deny that Jesus is the Christ. There's a big difference between saying, well, you know, I don't believe in God. You know, well, I, I don't know if I believe in God. Is, isn't that the definition of an agnostic? You know, you're not sure, you know, but you're not actively denying. The Jews say, oh, well, we believe in a God and Jesus is not it. That is the very definition of Antichrist, as I pointed out in number three of the Jesuit Jewish Connection, or the Jewish Jesuit Connection. So, how do they really feel about Jesus? Well, if you have a group of Jews that believe that we should keep the laws of Noah, now, where's that in the Bible? It's not. Jesus condemned the rabbis, the Pharisees, over and over and over for their man-made traditions, as I pointed out in parts 1, 2, and 3. Well, that's what the Noahide laws are, the laws of Noah. They're not in the Bible. They'll tell you, well, you know, they were handed by, down by Noah to the Jews and, 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 and but orally. Orally. Really? So, they call Jesus Yeshu. Y-E-S-H-U. Which means deceiver or may his name be blotted out from under heaven. From the book of life, by the way. So, and if you want to read the, um, the rest of the story, well... I've got some more links, and you can take a look at it. Now, if you look, my opinion is this. I believe the synagogue of Satan infiltrated the church at Rome with the express purpose of creating a diversion, a smokescreen. While everybody's looking at Rome, some people say New York City, other people say London, others say Mecca, others say Istanbul, and a number of those are on seven hills. Jerusalem, Istanbul, and Rome are all built on seven hills. The Bible says that the whore sits on seven mountains, seven hills. Well, Rome was infiltrated as a smokescreen so that everybody's looking at the Vatican, the Pope. Now the Jews in their legends thoroughly expect their Messiah to destroy and crush Rome. That's one of the reasons why they say they don't believe in Jesus. They say, well, our Messiah is going to bring peace through war. He's going to be a conquering Messiah. Well, they missed the part where Jesus is having two comings. The first time was the gospel of grace. The second time, he's going to come in flaming fire, bringing vengeance on those that know not God. He's going to be a conquering Messiah. But it's not until the end of the time of Jacob's trouble the tribulation. And if you don't believe that, write me. I'll give you a whole bunch of scripture verses, but if you're a Zionist, dispensational, um, pre-tribber, you'll probably fall for the Jewish Messiah, the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast. The Pope at Rome is just a diversion so that all the Christians, when my opinion is this, when the Messiah of the synagogue of Satan comes, 
he will crush Rome, or Rome will bow down to him. I'm not sure how Satan's going to play it. But then they can say, even Christ has come. Well, Matthew 24 warns you. Jesus warned us. The false Christ comes first. Okay? I mean, that's just the way it is. Now, why do I say that the uh, Rome is a smokescreen? Well, depending upon who you read, what you read from the Jewish sources, right? This is the deal. Sometimes the Jews will say that Rome has persecuted them, and then other times they will say Rome has supported them. So what is it? Depends on the audience. You can read the ADL, the Anti-Deflammation League. That group is well, they claim to be Jewish, okay? I say the synagogue of Satan. They claim to be Jews. Jesus said in John, uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, I know the blasphemy of those that say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Well, if you read in the ADL.org, in the press center, there's the, the link below in the description box, it says, the Vatican's strong defense of Jews. You know, they're saying that the Vatican and the Pope supports the Jews. But when you read the Jewish Encyclopedia, it talks about how the Vatican, what they call the Christian Church, how they persecuted the Jews. Of course, I believe the Jews they persecuted are the Sabbath-keeping, Bible-believing the Torah, Tanakh, believing Jews. You know, the remnant. And yes, I do believe there's going to be a remnant of Jews saved. Jerusalem has, uh, from what I understand, uh, according to a census I read, 800,000 Jews from a Jewish census. In the book of Revelation, I believe it's seven or 8,000 in Jerusalem that will eventually give glory to God in the time of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation. So that's basically 1%. 99% of the people living in Jerusalem, of the Jews, it's not necessarily all Jews. Those could be, you know, some, some Arabs. I mean, there's, you know, Jerusalem has a mix of people in it. There's Christians, Jews, and Arabs. So that seven or 8,000 could be any number of them. Matter of fact, let's read that. Okay, if you want to read it, uh, it's in Revelation 11. The verse I'm thir uh, speaking about is uh, uh, Revelation 11 and verse 13. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men, 7,000, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. Oh, okay, so it wasn't the uh, 7,000 that gave glory, but 7,000 that were slain, and there's a remnant that gives glory to the God of heaven. Now, these are people that were previously against him, but then realized they were fighting on the wrong side. Turn to 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 14. This is how we're going to be able to identify the false Christ. This is why they hate Paul. These so-called Torah keepers and these Messianic Jews... 1 Thessalonians 4.14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. 
And they're talking about the people that died. Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a secret rapture? No. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout! With the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. Yeah, it sounds like a secret rapture, don't it? A trump of God. The trumpet. Do, do, do. And with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. If the Christians are not caught up in the air to meet the Lord, it's the wrong Messiah. That's how you're going to be able to tell. But I've noticed this. Churches don't preach that. So, the Anti-Deflammation League is the synagogue of Satan kosher from top to bottom. And then I got another link. Very well researched. Probably the best website on the internet. It's www.jesus.com dash is dash lord dot com and then it's uh, backslash Weitzman w-e-i-t-z-m-a-n dot h-t-m that has so much good information a bunch of links where it shows where the Vatican was complacent with the um different things. For example, the murders under uh, communism, under Stalin, and also where millions and millions of Christians were killed. That was the real Holocaust, by the way, not the fake Holocaust. And then also it documents where Christians were murdered under the Nazi occupation. And I know people don't want to hear it. There's people that idolize Hitler and think he was the greatest thing in the world, but the fact of the matter is, I don't know of any Bible colleges that uh, Hitler founded. Do you? I can't think of any. I Nothing in history. And my best friends growing up in Miami, when I was growing up in the 60s, they were from Denmark. Now, Denmark was pretty much always allies with Germany. I mean, they were never enemies, not with Germany. Matter of fact, they're Nordic people. They, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes, that kind of stuff, you know. Um, well, Germany invaded Denmark that basically had no army that was neutral. Of course, they invaded uh, Norway and uh, what's the other? Well, no, okay, yeah, Denmark and Norway. Sweden was an ally of Germany, but pretty much neutral. And Finland was a, a an ally of Germany also because of uh, what the Finland was. Finland was like taken over by Russia, and then they got their independence. And then Russia fought trying to take back Finland, and yeah, it was just a mess. The whole history deal is a mess. But my best friends in Miami were from Denmark. The probably, I love those people. I, I couldn't love them anymore if, if they were my real parents. I couldn't do it. They were so good to me. They taught me so much. And they were older. 
You know, they were like in their 30s when Nazi Germany invaded Denmark, and they fought. The, uh, the husband fought in the underground. But uh, one day I made a remark that uh, it's a shame that the uh, Germans didn't win. And he made a remark to me that I, I'll probably never forget. He says, son, he says, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. And he proceeded to tell me some of the stuff that was going on. He said the Nazis were brutal. I mean, the, the Danish people never did anything to Germany. They were, they were always like friends and allies, and they did trade together. I mean, they, they didn't fight against Germany in World War I. You know, France and England did. I can understand Germany not liking France and England, but, you know, and what did Norway do? Norway didn't do nothing either. They were occupied. Of course, they, you know, they were saying, well, Germany said that they needed them for defensive positions, which I kind of understand, but, but I mean, Denmark was, you know, I don't know. But he says that the, the Germans treated the Danish people horribly, the Nazis. So, you know, what can I tell you? I, I, I wonder... You know, I kind of think uh, Hitler was probably another politician. You know, you say one thing, but then they do the other. It's just like when Hitler invaded the Ukraine. Ukraine under Stalin had 25% of their population murdered. They were the most Christian country in Europe at the time. Maybe Greece, Greece and Ukraine. Stalin... And you ought to get the book. The book is called Behind Communism by author Frank Britton, B-R-I-T-T-O-N. That book documents. And then get that book, look up all the names, and then look up all the names in a Jewish encyclopedia. You'll know who was behind communism by the time you're done. The synagogue of Satan was. And personally, I, I think... Um, I don't know. I think Hitler was a politician that told people one thing and did the opposite. But when Hitler invaded the Ukraine, the Ukrainian people came to Hitler and said, if you give us arms, we'll fight side by side with you against the communist Russians. He turned them down. Not only did he turn them down, he sicked the Gestapo on them. And, you know, they were... The, the Ukrainians were like, oh, great, we traded the Nazis for the communists. What's the difference? Uh, Stalin and Hitler, that's the difference. You know, I, and I know a lot of people idolize Hitler, but, uh, you know, if he'd have quit meddling, I think Germany could have won the war. The um, Battle of Dunkirk the evacuation of Dunkirk. British and French were defeated. There was a third of a million men on that beach. And uh, Hitler stopped the tanks, he stopped the Air Force, and he let them leave. He gave them like three to four days to evacuate. You know, that would have been the end of the war. But that's not what Satan wanted. Satan hates, and the synagogue of Satan, his children hate Germany. Germany, Martin Luther gave us the Bible in German, gave us the printing press that printed Bibles. Germany used to be one of the most Christian countries in Europe. And when I was in Germany, I was in southern Germany, when people would greet you in the morning, they would say, Chris gut, which means basically, literally translated, it means Christ good, or Christ is good. That's how people used to, to greet us, and I didn't know what it meant for a while. I had to, you know, Chris gut. Yeah, Chris gut. Guten Abend, good Morgen. You know. But the ADL praises the Vatican for their strong defense of the Jews. And then Jesus is Lord, the Weizmann documents over and over and over 
how the 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 rabbis supported communism and Nazism. And on the one hand, when they're talking to one group, they'll say, oh, the the you know, communists and the Nazis were bad and they were persecuting us Jews. And then on the other hand, they'll say, oh, these people were wonderful. Well, guess what? Communist Russia, they murdered millions of Christians. Millions and millions and millions. And then in the 70s, in communist Russia, the so-called Jews were complaining that they were not allowed to emigrate to the Israeli state. Well, they were all alive, but the Christians couldn't complain that they're not allowed to leave and emigrate to somewhere else because they were all killed. So how does that work? All right, so when you read the Bible, this is from the Jewish Encyclopedia. No, I'm sorry, JewishVirtualLibrary.org. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the Essenes. I don't know how much truth there is to this, but let's read it. The most important of the three, the Pharisees, this is a quote, because they are the spiritual fathers of modern Judaism. Now I've got the link down there. You can read it. The Pharisees, JewishVirtualLibrary.org. The most important of the three were the Pharisees because they are the spiritual fathers of modern Judaism. Their main distinguishing characteristic was a belief in an, in an oral law that God gave to Moses at Sinai along with the Torah. Oh, yeah. Hey, you don't like the written law? No problem. Moses gave us an oral law that, that overrode the written law. Uh, let's see. The main distinguishing characteristic was a belief in an oral law that God gave to Moses at Sinai along with the Torah. The Torah, or written law, was akin to to the U.S. Constitution in the sense that it set down a series of laws that were open to interpretation. Ah, the Ten Commandments written on stone, the written law, those are open to interpretation. Thou shall not kill? Well, you know, well, that only applies if it's a non, you know, that only applies if it's a Jew. If it's non-Jew, it's okay to kill them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's in their Talmud. The Pharisees believe that God also gave Moses the knowledge of what these laws meant. Ooh, what these laws really mean. And how they should be applied. The oral tradition was codified and written down roughly three centuries later in what is known as the Talmud. Unquote. And that's the Babylonian Talmud, by the way. Uh, the Pharisees main, also maintained, and I'm quoting, that an afterlife existed and that God punished the wicked and rewarded the righteous in the world to come. They also believed in a Messiah who would herald an era of world peace. Pharisees were, in a sense, blue-collar Jews who adhered to the tenets developed after the destruction of the temple. That is, such thing as individual prayer and assembly in synagogues. So, the most important of the three were the Pharisees because they are the spiritual fathers of modern Judaism. So, what did Jesus say about the Pharisees? Let's read. Well, let's read about the Pharisees, what Jesus had to say. Matthew 6 and verse 2. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, alms is charity, you know, you give the poor something. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets. 
that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Matthew 6, 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Ooh. Matthew 23. We're going to read some really anti-Semitic words here. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Remember, Pharisees are the fathers of modern Judaism. Oral law, oral traditions, traditions of the elders, man-made rules that circumvent the laws that God wrote in stone, the written laws in stone. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. Neither, For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Jesus said that the, the Pharisees, the modern-day Jews, are hypocrites. They shut up the kingdom of heaven against people. They don't go in, and they don't allow those that are entering to go in either. They close the door. Jesus, the greatest anti-Semite that ever lived, according to the Jews. Verse Matthew 23, 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. I've mentioned this in other studies. I'll mention it again because I don't know when I get new listeners. How do you devour a widow's house? Well, there was a thing that when a man was dying, and, you know, he had his house and his land, the, the widow, well, the wife would call, or the, uh, the husband or whoever would call the, the rabbi to pray for him. Well, then the rabbi would get the guy on his deathbed, push everybody, you know, kick everybody out of the room and say, oh, I have to be alone to pray for this man. Oy vey. And then next thing you know, he dies. Maybe he had a little help. Maybe he didn't. I don't know. But then the rabbi comes out of the room proudly and says, Oy vey, your husband gave me Gave the, the synagogue the house and the lands. Oh, how, what a wonderful man. He gave it to us on his deathbed. He says he wants to donate this land and my this house to God. Well, guess what? Devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. So if it was winter... The rabbi would take possession of the house and the lands and kick the widow and her children out of the house. Well, guess what? The Roman Catholic Church did the same thing in England. Do you know why? There has to be five witnesses to sell up a house. There has to be the buyer, the seller, a notary, and two witnesses. Five people to sell a house. Do you know why? because of this practice. The Roman Catholic Church did the same thing that the Pharisees did. They devoured widows' houses. Now there has to be five witnesses to sell a house because England did this under common law because the cry was so great against this practice. So, you know, you can substitute an attorney in there somewhere, you know, for the buyer or the seller, and maybe, you know, uh, but there has to be a notary and two uh, two unrelated witnesses. The witnesses can't be related to anybody in that room. Verse 15. Jesus is on a roll here. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass. What does compass mean? A compass points north. You know, it, it has four directions, northeast, southwest. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte. That's a follower, a believer. 
For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold, twice. You make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Wow. You wonder why the Jews don't like Jesus? Verse 23, Matthew 23, 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. Yeah. They didn't preach judgment, mercy, and faith. No, 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 no. They're just like the 700 Club and the TBN preachers on TV. Oh, you got a tithe. You got a tithe. You got a tithe. Do they preach judgment, mercy, and faith? No. They preach the tithe. Look at the hypocrites on, on TBN. Praise the Jesus, I'll sell you my book. It's only in 1995. Praise the Jesus. Matthew 23, 25. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye may clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Verse 27, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. 29, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Because ye build the tombs of the prophets, because ye build the tombs of the prophets, Next time somebody tells you it was the Roman Catholic Church or the New York City that's Mystery Babylon that killed the prophets, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchers of the righteous. Huh. Jesus is on a roll. How many times did he call the Pharisees hypocrites? Remember now, Judaism, the Jewish encyclopedia and all that, says that Phariseeism is modern Judaism. Now, there's a, uh, another website, Jewish website, J-A-H-G USA website. I'm not sure what it stands for. It doesn't matter. Just another Antichrist website. But it's www.noahide.com and backslash yeshu, Y-E-S-H-U dot H-T-M. I'm going to read, they, they call Jesus Yeshu. And I'm going to quote, I want to read a few snippets here. Who is Jesus? Now this is what the Jews really believe about Jesus. Who is Jesus? Quote, the Bible gave a warning about a dangerous false prophet. Ooh. Who would arise to test our faith in G-D? In Deuteronomy 13, G-D, yeah, I, I, I don't even want to go there. G-D describes this false prophet as a member of the Jewish people who would tell true prophecies and would have the power of miracles. See, even the Jews admit that Jesus performed miracles. Let's continue. G.D. himself would give this false prophet the power to perform miracles and reveal prophecy. But the false prophet would try to seduce people away from God's law. Oh yeah, he, he would try to seduce people away from God's written law. While the hypocrite Pharisees would try to lead people to God's oral law that doesn't exist. Oh, I'm sorry, that's my commentary. But the false prophet would try to seduce the people away from God's law and toward strange gods unknown to Judaism. I guess the Jews never read Emmanuel, God with us. The purpose would be to test whether we are truly committed to living under the law or whether we will be dazzled 
and fall for the temptation to join a false path to salvation. In the, they're talking about God's grace in his son, Jesus Christ, people. A false path to salvation. This is what they really honestly believe. Let's continue. In this biblical passage, G.D. commands the Jews to kill this false prophet, lest this evil spread and destroy many souls. Huh. Uh, let's see. All right, let's keep going. I, I can't read the whole thing because if I do, they can hit me with a copyright thing. So I'm just going to read a few excerpts. You can read it on your own. Makes me sick in my stomach myself, but what can I tell you? Uh, let's see. In, Ver in Deuteronomy 17, this false prophet is also described as someone who would rebel against the authority of the judges of the Jewish people and who should be put to death for his rebellion, rebelliousness. Who are the judges? The highest court in Israel was the Sanhedrin, which was established by Moses and which lasted more than 15 centuries. The members of the Sanhedrin were the rabbis known as Pharisees. Pishurim, those with the explanation. God gave permanent authority to these judges to interpret the law and God's word. Ooh, I... So... You got a choice. You are either you're going to believe the Jews or you're going to believe Jesus. It's coming one day, people. And it is a commandment to follow their decisions without turning ever so slightly ever turning ever slightly to the right or to the left. But the false prophet would challenge the authority of the Sanhedrin, thus revealing himself to be an evil man. Ooh. Let's see. Let's skip down. Elsewhere, this false prophet is described as a king who would disregard the God of his fathers, exalting himself as a king and giving honor to this new Godhead. They're talking about the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Uh, then they go, this man to, known today as Jesus fulfilled all these prophecies. He became a king over the Christian church changed the original law, doing away with the Hebrew calendar and the biblical holidays. Jesus didn't do away with the biblical holidays. That was the Catholic Church that the Jews, I'm sorry, the synagogue of Satan infiltrated. Wasn't it, wasn't it the Vatican that changed Passover to Easter? Wasn't it the Vatican that changed the Sabbath on Saturday, the sun, sun day, day of the sun, S-U-N-D-A-Y? Not, not S O N, D A Y. You see, they play both. Satan plays both sides here. Um, you know, Passover. I mean, you know, if you, I'm not talking about going to the Jewish sources, but if you take a look at God's holy days, in the in the Old Testament, and look at them, you can see God's plan of salvation. You know, Passover was the slaying of the sinless lamb. The, the, I mean, the, 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 the lamb without blemish, without spot, whose blood was shed. Well, when John the Baptist saw Jesus at the River Jordan before he baptized him, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that um, taketh away the sins of the world. I could be paraphrasing that, but, you know... Um, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Leaven was always likened unto sin. Well, Jesus called himself the bread of life, who had no sin. Then you had the Day of Atonement, at one mint, with God. Atonement. That was the day that we were to fast and pray and reflect upon all the sins for that we've done for the previous, you know, in times past, and to get right with God, at one meant with God. And then you got the Feast of Trumpets, which, uh, you know, you got the seven trumpets in Revelation. Jesus says he's going to, uh, uh, Paul says that Jesus 
would return at the last trump. You know, it's quite possible that Jesus will return at the, the Feast of Trumpets. I, you know, other than tabernacles, you know, take a look at it. It's an interesting study. In the Hebrew calendar, you can actually see the plan of salvation. And the spring calendar has been pretty much fulfilled. Now we're just waiting to fulfill the fall calendar. Oh, and another thing, too. Why does the new year start in the dead of winter? You know, between January, you know, January 1st. That's a dead, dead of winter. Well, why is that? God's calendar started in the spring. It was agricultural, you know. Um, Passover was like two weeks after the beginning of the year. And it's usually April, you know, March or April. So, you know, Christ didn't change the, uh, the Hebrew calendar. It was the Vatican that did this, who they've infiltrated, the synagogue of Satan infiltrated. Uh, let's see. All right, let's see what else he's got. Um and then they list a whole bunch of things where, you know, uh, he repudiated the laws of kosher food and he uh, violated the Sabbath by picking grain and he healed a man's arm. Oh, how horrible. He healed a man's arm and then he openly defiled and disobeyed the rabbis, repudiating their authority. This is recorded in many places throughout the New Testament, but look especially at Matthew 23. And John 8, Matthew 23, 13 through 39. We just read that. And John 8, verses 44 and 45. John 8, 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye shall do. He was a murderer from the beginning. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Oh yeah, John 8, 44. The most anti-Semitic verse in the Bible, according to the Jews. The New Testament is considered the most anti-Semitic book in the world, even more than Mein Kampf. Uh, let's read, quote, The Babylonian, the Talmud, Babylonian edition, records other sins of Jesus the Nazarene. He and his disciples practiced sorcery and black magic and led Jews astray into idolatry and were sponsored by foreign Gentile purpose, uh, powers for the purpose of subverting Jewish worship. He was sexually immoral, worshipped statue, statues of stone, a brick, and was cut off from the Jewish people for his wickedness and refusal to repent. He learned witchcraft in Egypt to perform miracles. Um, you know, and then it goes on and on. So, let's listen to this. Uh, second, uh, third to the last paragraph. This is Noahide.law. What is the true key to salvation? Those who return to the law. The seven commandments for the children of Noah. According to the eternal covenant made with Noah in Genesis 9. Uh, where's that? Where's the seven laws of Noah? The seven commandments of the children of Noah. Where is that? Where are these Noahide laws in the Bible? Uh, they're not. They're from the Pharisees, modern Judaism, the oral law, man-made, made-up, man-made traditions. Uh, so what is the true key to salvation? Um, you know, the, se the seven commandments to the children of Noah, according to the eternal covenant, blah, blah, blah. And who assist the Jewish people will be saved Ooh, we got to assist the Jewish people. We'll be saved and we'll participate in the miracles and revelations, including worshiping in the third temple under the kingship of the Messiah. Ah, they want to build a new temple. Now, I, I know people argue and say, well, you know, there doesn't have to be a new temple. I, I won't say they're wrong, and I don't know for sure, but there's two... Jewish groups that want to build a new temple. The Temple Mount Faithful and the Temple Institute. Look them up, people. The Jews are serious. They've already redone the Sanhedrin. 
So we got to keep the laws of Noah that don't exist in the Bible. We got to assist the Jewish people. We'll be saved and we'll participate in the miracles and revelations, including worship, worshiping in the third temple under the kingship of the Messiah. Where's that in the Bible? Let's take a look. You know what the Jews are expecting? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. Since they deny Jesus and they don't believe him and they don't like Paul, they hate Paul. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. You know, pre-tribbers will try to deceive you and make you think the day of Christ and the day of the Lord are two different events. One's the pre-trib rapture and the other is the second coming at the end of the tribulation. Well, I ask you a question. Is Jesus Christ Lord? I say yes. So how can the day of Christ and the day of the Lord be two different events? Uh, they can't figure it out either, but, you know, they got to have some way to make it work. Verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, what day? The second coming. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Who? The Messiah of the synagogue of Satan. Verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Temple Mount Faithful people, the Temple Institute, they want to build it. What a slap in the face of what Jesus did on the cross, shedding his blood. They're going to redo animal sacrifices, people. They want to. I don't know if they'll do it 100%, but i tell you what. I think it's going to happen. That's my opinion. Okay? I'm not always right. And if you don't believe me, just ask the, uh, the mother of my children that divorced me. She'll tell you, oh, yeah, Bob, he's definitely not always right. So, verse 5. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity, mystery Babylon? For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. He's going to have miracles, people. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They didn't want the love of Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace. Verse 11, For this cause God shall send them strong delusion. Do you know what a delusion is? It's, it's making somebody believe something that's not true. That's a delusion. When somebody's delusional, uh, you know, people with Alzheimer's are delusional, oftentimes. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, what truth? The truth of Jesus Christ, but had pleasure in unrighteousness, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief 
of the truth. Wow. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, that's right, day of the Lord, day of Christ. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. So, the moral of this story, the wicked's going to be revealed. There's, there's going to be a falling away first. The man of sin is going to be revealed, the son of perdition. He's going to oppose and exalt himself above, above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Verse 4. Okay. Um... Verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Remember when Moses went to Pharaoh and he was doing all the plagues, you know, the, the locusts and the frogs and all this and that. And the magicians of Egypt were able to duplicate these things also. They, uh, Moses turned his staff into a serpent, a snake. Well, they, the magicians of Egypt did the same thing. But then Moses' serpent swallowed up their staffs, ate them. You know, Satan's going to have power to do signs and lying wonders. And he's, they're going to be deceived. Let's go back and read what the Noahide says. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. All right, the third, Noahide.com, the third paragraph from the bottom. Uh, let's see. So, what is the true key of salvation? Those who return to the law, you know, the Noahide laws, and who assist the Jewish people will be saved and will participate in the miracles and revelations, including worshiping in the third temple under the kingship of the Messiah. Hmm. All the old Gentile religions of the world will disappear. Catholicism. Christianity, Buddhism, Islam. This is what the Jews are expecting. And their followers were turned to the Jews for spiritual leadership. Until then, Christians are spiritually blinded and cannot yet understand GD's wisdom in the Bible. Ooh. Ours is the last generation of the era of sin and evil and the first of the messianic era. Yeah, beware of Messianic Jews. When Jews tell you they're Messianic, ask them the name of their Messiah. And if they say Yeshua, well, I'd like to tell them to go to hell, but I don't know. That's my opinion. Ours is the last generation of the era of sin and evil and the first of the Messianic era. Indeed, for the first time in history, there is a growing consensus of leading rabbis willing to willing to share the name of the man most suited to be the Messiah, and they are agreeing that he is the Lubavitcher Reb, Reb, R-E-B-B-E, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson. Um, go to Google and type in Rabbi Oral Suction. This is what these people, these Lubavitch people, believe. They're the ones that the rabbis do the circumcision and then suck the blood off the baby's penis with their mouth. This is them, people. This is this is them. You know, and there's a herpes outbreak. 
in uh, the Israeli land, New York City, and uh, California, Los Angeles, where all these people do this wonderful oral tradition practice. I mean, babies are dying because they don't have an immune system, and they're getting herpes down there from this rabbi's mouth after he performs a circumcision to suck the blood. This is the Lubavitch movement, people. These are the people that are going to lead us to the Messiah? Really? Uh, the Reb is the spiritual leader of our generation, having boldly stirred up controversy over vital issues which, in which other leaders have remained tragically silent or have even caved in the growing forces of darkness. They're talking about Christianity, people. Uh, let's see. The Reb is a direct descendant of King David and has received a true prophecy from G.D. that we who are alive in this generation shall be the first in history to see the coming of the true Messiah. Ooh, many Jews are eagerly, eagerly anticipating the Reb's resurrection from the grave, ready to reestablish the Sanhedrin and anoint the king. Ooh. Do you actually understand or know what the, the lo, no hide laws are. Uh, one of the first no hide law is no worshiping of false gods. Well, guess what? To these people, Jesus is a false god. What's the penalty? Death. Method of execution? Beheading. Where have I read that before? Turn to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. You know, people, there, there's going to be the, the false prophet and the beast. The Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, whatever. But the false prophet is going to do miracles. Just like Elijah did. And, uh, matter of fact, the Jews are expecting Elijah. So, don't be surprised if the false prophet calls himself Elijah, and then the two witnesses of God that confront the beast, don't be surprised if there's two people claiming to be Elijah running around. Because Elijah is coming back. It's just, is it going to be the one the Jews believe, or is it going to be the one that, uh, the, one of the two witnesses? So... All right, let's take a look at Revelation chapter 13. Uh, let's start at verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So he looks like a lamb, but he speaks as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Listen carefully. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. Now, I did a study on Elijah. If you're interested, you can go to my um, you know, the YouTube thing and do the search on my channel. I did an hour and 45 minute study on Elijah. Elijah did the same thing. He called fire down from the sky and devoured, um, let's see, I think a hundred different men on 
you know, 50, 50 men and a captain that were trying to arrest him. He devoured the enemy, devoured them with fire. He called fire down from heaven to devour a sacrifice for against the prophets of Baal, uh, Baal, Baal, B A A L. You know, uh, the two witnesses, they're going to have the same power to call fire down from the sky, but the false prophet is going to have the same power. That's why the he's going to probably claim to be Elijah. You know, and if you've never read the entire Bible, you should, because Jesus warned about us being deceived. Let no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. And that's what this guy's going to do. I'm Christ. I'm the Messiah, the false prophet. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the bees, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword, and did live. Now, you know, the, the, the Jews that do believe the Bible, they're going to be like, uh, uh, now wait a minute here, we're going to be worshiping an image? Something's wrong with this picture. You know, the Ten Commandments, uh, no idols, you know? There's not going to be many of them, believe me. Um, I, I, I always, God always has his remnant. You know, people get mad at me and say, every Jew is a Canaanite and every Jew is damned to hell and this and that and the other. I, most of the people that call themselves Jews and Christians will probably end up in the lake of fire. You know, almost every single church in the United States teaches the preacher of rapture. They're going to fall for this stuff. You better believe it. They're going to fall for this stuff. You know how many times I've been kicked out of churches for uh, in Bible studies that I've invited to? I was invited to Bible studies and I started questioning. Oh, you got to leave. You're divisive. Uh, what? Yeah, they boot you out in Christian love. Or is it hate? Uh, let's see. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, and the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused a fall, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let he that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is... Six hundred, six score, and six. Six, six, six. So, uh, let's see. How about this? Verse 19, Revelation 19 and verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles, miracles before him, with which he deceived them, that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image, these both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Not good, people. Not good. So, you know, I think some somehow Satan's going to pull this off. Think about it. He's had six thousand almost six thousand years to come up with some kind of a plan he's had 1900 years to come up with a plan since the death of christ i mean let's think about it you you plan something for 1900 years you're going to come up with just about every possibility and these people that don't know the bible they're going to be they're going to be deceived let's face it you know the church people that don't bother to read the Bible, why do you think there's 666 different versions of the Bible? I mean, the, the new modern Bibles, are uh, the manuscripts are missing thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of words and thousands of verses. Do you know that in the 
the what the the manuscripts that they say are older um, and, and more reliable, they don't even have the Book of Revelation in there. All those verses that I just w read, that warning about the uh, the false prophet, are missing from the manuscripts for the Bibles that the new Bible, modern Bible versions are based upon, the book of Revelation doesn't even exist in those modern, I mean those so-called ancient manuscripts. Stick with your King James Bible, people. Stick with it. I mean, you know, you can't go wrong. Um, let's read one more thing. The more I study this out, the more I'm convinced the Antichrist, will, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast, is going to be a Jew. Just like Judas Iscariot, you know, who betrayed Jesus. I mean, Judas, believe it or not, that's the Greek rendering of the word Judah or Jew. Judas Iscariot. His very name meant of Judah. But he was probably of the Canaanites, you know, uh, Judah married a Canaanite woman. And like I mentioned in the first uh, video, the origin of the Canaanites, this is part of the Iron Kingdom series. And uh, I'm going to go back and start doing about the Iron Kingdom of Satan. But before I do, before I close this out, Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. We read it again before we'll read it again. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. You ever hear people say soul sleep? Well, you know, I can show you another verse uh, where the souls were under the altar, and they were crying. How long, O Lord? before you avenge our blood upon those that live upon the earth. You know, people teach soul sleep, the Jehovah's Witnesses for one. Um, you know, and they'll say, well, yeah, well, it says here the soul that dies, it knows nothing. Well, yeah, they know nothing about what's going on on earth, but if they're under the altar, they know what's going on, you know, in heaven. I don't know, but this isn't about soul sleep. I did another study on soul sleep. Um, if you're interested, you know, you could do a search. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And that's only the beginning, people. Well, in John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is Chaplain Bob, Light of the World Ministries. All blessing, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen.